Welcome back to the third lesson of our Paschotide Catechism. Today we'll be talking about St. Mary Magdalene. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. May we be helped by the intercession of Blessed Mary Magdalene, we beseech thee, O Lord, who in answer to her prayers didst raise her brother Lazarus to life after he'd been dead for four days. Thou who livest and reignest with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, who was St. Mary Magdalene? We, we saw in the last uh, lesson that she was present at the, at the empty tomb and also at the cross, at the foot of the cross, according to the four evangelists. She's the first uh, recorded um, encounter of our Lord, of our risen Lord after the resurrection. And so today we're going to enter into a little bit the question of who was Mary Magdalene, her identity. And this has become a little bit of a polemic in more recent times. So first of all, I'm going to uh, read a, a, a little article, part of an article from Wikipedia. You might ask, well, Canon Post, why would you why would you read something from Wikipedia? Well, the reason is because people read Wikipedia, and so public opinion is is formed by Wikipedia, and it's a little bit like um, if you have a very uh, smart friend who knows a lot, who who you can learn things from, but uh, when he doesn't know what he's talking about, he just makes it up. That's, that's a little bit what Wikipedia is, but it's the, it's the go-to source of information for, for most people. And if you Google anything, uh, if you Google Mary Magdalene, Wikipedia will come up. So I've got this, uh, this portion of an article from Wikipedia, and um, I think it is typical of, of what you read today anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's from this source, but another source, you're likely to read something similar. So this is what it says about, uh, about Mary Magdalene, about the Catholic Church. It says, The inaccurate portrayal of Mary Magdalene as a prostitute began after a series of Easter sermons delivered in 581, when Pope Gregory I conflated Mary Magdalene, who is introduced in Luke 8, verse 2, with Mary of Bethany, Luke 10, uh, verse 39, the unnamed sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7. Pope Gregory's false portrayals in an, in an inaccurate but widespread belief that Mary Magdalene was, I'm sorry, Pope Gregory's false portrayals resulted in an inaccurate but widespread belief that Mary Magdalene was a repentant prostitute or promiscuous woman. Elaborate medieval legends from Western Europe describe Mary Magdalene's wealth and beauty, etc., etc., etc. The false portrayal by the Catholic Church of Mary Magdalene was a major controversy in the years leading up to the Reformation, and some Protestant leaders rejected it. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church continued to use Mary Magdalene as a symbol of penance. In 1969, the false portrayal of Mary Magdalene was removed from the General Roman Calendar by Pope Paul VI, but the incorrect view of her as a former prostitute had been promoted by the Catholic Church for almost 1,400 years and has persisted in popular culture, etc., etc. So there you have it. Um, Mary Magdalene uh, is not a, a woman of ill repute, according to uh, Wikipedia. And the Catholic Church uh, for 1,400 years, and particularly the great ignoramus, Pope Gregory the great um, conflated different Marys and put them together and the sinful woman. And so we have this uh, pop culture um, portrayal of her, but, um, but of course, uh, Wikipedia knows better and also the Protestant reformers knew better. So we're going to try to take a look at this a little bit more. Uh, the question of who was St. Mary Magdalene and whether Pope uh, St. Gregory the Great was in fact uh, the fool that uh, apparently everyone thinks he is now. So the first question we need to answer then is to look at uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany or the sister of La Lazarus and Martha. So if you, if you consider the, what is the argument being made here um, for the, um, the duplication of Marys, if you will. 
it is that never in the Gospels do you ever find the phrase Mary Magdalene, the sister of Lazarus, or Mary Magdalene, the sister of Martha. Magdalene and sister of Lazarus and Martha, they're never put together in a single phrase in the scriptures. So the argument then is the two are never explicitly, uh, never explicitly conflated. Therefore, they're two different people, certainly, and the Catholic Church... Um, has had it wrong for 1400 years and that's certain that's that's the argument okay now as you know in the scriptures if you if you have even casual reading of the scriptures the same person is often called by by several names so the question is uh, is there any way to tie Mary Magdalene and Mary the sister of Martha together or is it certain from the gospel accounts that we're talking about two uh, different women? Now, most of the Matthew, St. Matthew and St. Mark only talk about um, St. Mary Magdalene at the, at the foot of the cross and at the tomb. It's in Luke's gospel and John's gospel that we're going to uh, receive more information about her. So to begin with, let's go to St. John's Gospel, and we'll look in St. John's Gospel. We find uh, in chapter 11, you have the famous account of the res resurrection of Lazarus. So there, um, St. Mary will be identified by as the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And we'll come, we don't need to look at that in, in great detail at the moment, but um, that's the first time we encounter her in John's Gospel. And then the second time that we encounter her is in chapter 12. We are now in Holy Week, and we have the account of the anointing of our Lord, chapter 12 of St. John's Gospel. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Pasch, coming to Bethania, where Lazarus had been dead, whom Jesus raised to life. And they made him a supper there, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that were at table with him. Mary, therefore, took a pound of ointment of right spikenard of great price, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the anointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, he that was about to betray him, said, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and having the purse, carried the things that were put therein. Jesus therefore said, Let her alone, that she may keep it against the day of my burial. For the poor you have always with you, but me you have not always. So here the part um, that I've, I've put in bold and underlined let her alone that she may keep it against the day of my burial. So if we look at the evidence here, first of all, John never um, identifies this Mary as Mary Magdalene. She's the sister of Lazarus and, and Martha, the woman that will be called by many pro um, modern scholars, also Protestants, as Mary of Bethany. Of course, the term Mary of Bethany is never used by the scriptures either. But here we see this woman, Mary, who anoints our Lord. But what I would like to draw your attention to in particular is the words of Jesus in verse 7. Let her alone that she may keep it against the day of my burial. Now, if we fast forward in John's gospel and we look and we ask ourselves what uh, what happens at the burial of Jesus and afterward, John will only identify one woman by name. It's Mary Magdalene. So we see other women present uh, at, the, at the tomb in the other Gospels, but in John's Gospel, the only woman that he mentions by name is Mary Magdalene. So Mary Magdalene has, a, has an essential role in the, this Gospel as um, the first one to encounter the risen Lord. And before his, his death in Holy Week, we have a Mary who is anointing our Lord. And our Lord says, let her alone that she may keep it against the day of my burial. So there's a connection made between the woman who anoints our Lord 
uh, six days before the Passover, and then um, the event of his, his burial and anointing. So here, either in John's Gospel, we have a kind of non sequitur. We have this loose end with, with Jesus making a reference to, to uh, his future burial, which has no, has no follow-up. And then a totally different Mary appears uh, with, with the intention of anointing our Lord um, at the end of John's Gospel, or in fact the two uh, come together. Okay? So knowing anything about John's Gospel, how everything's interrelated, one thing is a sign of another thing, and the, the characters in John's Gospel are all... Um, they're not introduced haphazardly. Each has um, an important role to fulfill. Knowing that, we can either believe that uh, John has thrown something out here, which has no, there's no follow-up, it's a non sequitur, or, um, or the account of the anointing and the account of the burial of our Lord are connected in the thought of St. John, and in fact as well. So... Perhaps John himself is is confused about the identity identity of Mary. If we would believe modern scholars, or Jesus uh, has has thrown something out that is irrelevant to what's going to happen later. Again, if we would believe our our brave modern scholars, but here to me we have a very explicit linking of this Mary and Mary Magdalene, whom we see at the end of John's Gospel. So. Then we might ask ourselves, well, so why is it that uh, Mary, the, the sister of, of Martha and Lazarus, is never called Mary Magdalene explicitly? Well, the use of surnames throughout the Bible is for identification, so we can tell a one Mary apart from another. We know already from the last time that there are several Marys uh, in the Gospel accounts. So the surname uh, helps us to identify the person. So I would suggest that for the evangelists, each time uh, Mary is connected to Lazarus or Martha, it's, it is uh, superfluous to add a surname because uh, by being with her siblings, it's clear who we're talking about. Whereas when she appears alone in the Gospels, then we, then we need to add a surname in order to, to identify her. Normally, a woman is not going to be identified by another woman. She'd be um, identified by the name of her father or by a brother or by even by her sons. We saw an exception in John's Gospel um, that uh, the woman Mary, who elsewhere is called the mother of James and Joseph, is identified by John as the sister of Our Lady, um, probably because... Um, our Lady uh, being an extremely important person, um, it was uh, justified to uh, break this convention in, in identifying um, this woman by her relationship to Our Lady. But normally, uh, women would have been identified by their relationship to some man, or also by a place name is another way of making a surname. So. Mary Magdalene, Magdala was a was a town in Galilee, so that's probably um, the origin of the surname Magdalene. So that's the uh, first question we look at. To me, it's clear that there is a an ex a pretty explicit connection between the two. Otherwise, we have these accounts in John's Gospel, which uh, have various loose ends, which add up to really nothing in the end. So, and knowing uh, how carefully John's gospel is constructed, that doesn't make any sense to me. So then we have the second question. Uh, not only do we have the question of Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany, whether it's uh, one person or two, but then the second question is about the anonymous woman of Luke 7. So, here we have... As I just read to you, there's an account of the anointing of Jesus in, in John chapter 12. Interestingly enough, Matthew and Mark are also going to uh, recount an anointing by an anonymous woman at the same time. It matches the details of John's account. But Luke is going to give us a, a very different account, which comes much earlier in his gospel. So we're going to need to turn to uh, Luke chapter 7.
to see this account. Uh, verse 36 it says, And one of the Pharisees desired to eat with him, that is, desired to eat with Jesus. And he went into the house of the Pharisee and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman that was in the city, a sinner, when she knew that he sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And standing behind at his feet, she began to wash his feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And the Pharisee who had invited him, seeing it, spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know surely who and what manner of woman this is that touches him and that she is a sinner. And then Jesus uh, goes on to tell um, the little parable of the, of the creditor who forgives the debts of two debtors. And then if we continue on, we find in chapter 8, right after this account of the anointing of this uh, anonymous woman, it says in chapter 8, And it came to pass afterwards that he traveled through the cities and towns, preaching and evangelizing the kingdom of God and the twelve with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, who was called Magdalene, out of whom seven devils were gone forth, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who ministered unto him of their substance. Okay, so when we look uh, at St. Luke's account of the anointing, the, the woman is anonymous, her name is not given, and St. Mary Magdalene is going to be identified in the following chapter in verse 2 as a follower of Jesus from whom uh, Jesus drove out seven devils. So there is no explicit um, identification of the two. However, uh, St. Gregory the Great and St. Bede, for example, are going to make this identification. Are they fools to have done so? Well, let's, let's consider their own words here. I have, again, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' um, Catena Aria, the, the golden chain. And let's read uh, what Bede and uh, St. Gregory the Great say. It says, Mary Magdalene is the same of whose repentance without mention of her name we have just read. For the evangelist, when he relates her going with our Lord, rightly distinguishes her by her known name. But when describing the sinner as penitent, he speaks of her generally as a woman, lest the mark of her former guilt should blacken a name of so great report, out of whom seven devils are reported to have gone, that it might be shown that she was full of all vices. Then St. Gregory the Great, we have adding, for what is understood by the seven devils, but all vices. For since all time is comprehended by seven days, rightly by the number seven is universality represented. Mary therefore had seven devils, for she was full of every kind of vice. So that is, um, that is the interpretation of St. Gregory the Great and St. Bede. Now, of course, we've, we've already talked about numbers, that numbers are important. The number seven, um, represents a plenitude. Elsewhere, our Lord will speak about the devil that is uh, driven out, and then later on he returns with seven devils that are more wicked than himself. So this number seven um, is, is not just haphazard, but uh, always symbolic in the Bible. So um, the, the interpretation of St. Gregory the Great and St. Bede of a plenitude of vice is, uh, is classic, it follows the allegorical method that is used by all of the fathers. And also, there's no uh, particular emphasis here on her status as a woman of ill repute. Uh, it's not the emphasis. It's that she's a sinner, that she is filled with all vices, and that Jesus heals her. So um, this identification of, of Mary Magdalene as a sinful woman is not... Um, is not meant to, to denigrate her as such, to emphasize her sin, but in fact to emphasize uh, her repentance and the grace uh, that she receives from our Lord. Okay? So um, it's not the intention of the fathers really to focus on whether she's, she was a woman of ill repute or not. It's not. That's not very important. The fact that she had seven uh, devils cast out of her would suggest that she was not living a great life um, to begin with. So... Um, so to quibble over what exactly her sins uh, were, is, it's not really important. It's not the uh, purpose of the fathers. Maybe in 
popular culture later on. Um, more emphasis will be given to this because it's a bit lurid, but but it's not the it's not what's important for the fathers. What's important for the fathers is that this woman approaches our Lord with great faith and hope and love, and that she is rewarded for it. She receives um, the forgiveness of her sins. And in fact, um, Jesus will compare her favorably um, to the Pharisees who are viewed unfavorably because um, they're lacking in, in all contrition and all spirit of penance for their sins. And that's what is uh, brought out by the parable that uh, Jesus tells in chapter 7. So, um, so all that to me makes a great amount of sense. It's what the church uh, has generally presented the faithful with. It's what's important on a moral level. We want to note also that it's classic not to identify a, a sinner by name. There's the famous phrase to name the sin, but not the sinner. So uh, in this case, it may very well be that Luke uh, prefers to keep her anonymous because she's one of the famous uh, disciples of, of Jesus. And so he's not, going to, um, he's not going to explicitly by name identify her, her sins, but just speak of an anonymous woman who's then uh, reintroduced in the next chapter, uh, Mary Magdalene. Also, we can look elsewhere. There's some interesting examples of this in, in the Gospels. Uh, Matthew is another example. So Matthew, of course, was a tax collector. So for the Jews, uh, he would have been held in very low esteem. Uh, tax collectors uh, to this day, I don't think, are generally very popular. But, um, but also the, the sins of uh, avarice, uh, of theft, of injustice were associated with tax collectors because often they, they skimmed off the top. So uh, Matthew had a profession before his call, which was held in very low esteem. And when we look at the accounts of his call, the, um, the evangelists Mark and Luke will identify the tax collector as Levi. They will not say Matthew, but they'll identify him as Levi, uh, most certainly another name that he had, as we, as we said, um, biblical characters usually have, um, very often have several names. So who is the only evangelist who's going to identify the tax collector as Matthew, but Matthew himself? So Matthew, who's talking about his own sinful life, his own call from our Lord, is going to be not be bashful about describing himself as a tax collector, but the other evangelists are going to use a name which is maybe less well known, in order not to, uh, in order to be more discreet um, and more delicate in their uh, description of Matthew. That's one uh, one example. Another very interesting example is when we look at the uh, descriptions of the denial of St. Peter, his, his threefold denial of our Lord during the Passion. Uh, what do we find when we, when we compare the Gospels? Of the four Gospels, the one that contains uh, the most detail, which is interesting because it's the shortest Gospel, but the one that has the most detail on this, on this subject, and also the one that will have the harshest judgment on the unbelief of the apostles after the resurrection is the Gospel of St. Mark. Now, what do we know about St. Mark himself? Mark, uh, we, we see in the epistles of St. Peter, had joined uh, St. Peter, who's a bit of a disciple of Peter, also probably his secretary, who, who may have written um, the the two epistles, uh, assuming that St. Peter probably was not able to write himself. He probably dictated to a scribe. The scribe is probably uh, St. Mark. And also St. Jerome, for example, identifies um, St. Peter as, a, in a sense, as the author of Mark's Gospel, that uh, St. Mark follows St. Peter. He collects together, he compiles the material of Peter's catechism, of his teachings on Jesus. He's going to put it together. He's going to uh, write the gospel, submit it to Peter's approval. And so St. Mark, who receives his teachings directly from Peter, is going to 
give the most uh, severe account of Peter's um, denial. So we see um, Peter will judge himself harshly, whereas the other evangelists will be, um, be more careful in their judgment about Peter. So all of this is, um, gives us a consistent picture of the way in which the scriptures approach certain, certain characters and their sins. And then finally, I'd like to point out um, that St. Luke's Gospel is, uh, is the Gospel, we could call it the Gospel of Mercy. The, the theme of mercy is extremely important in St. Luke. We have certain accounts um, in this Gospel that are not present in the others. For example, the, um, the fa very famous parable of the Good Samaritan. Also, um, the, the lost sheep is in uh, St. Luke's Gospel. And the account of the good sh good thief, the good thief who on the cross, the thief who receives uh, mercy from our Lord, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. It's only Saint Luke that is going to include um, this account in his gospel. So all of the all of the accounts of the uh, stories of our Lord's life, which and the parables which. Um, place in the forefront the, the, the phenomenon, the fact of God's mercy, are very important to St. Luke. And he's going to invite us, as will the other evangelists, to see um, not just the historical event, that is, some woman was forgiven by, by Jesus 2,000 years ago, what does that have to do with us? But to invite us to see ourselves, to see you, yourself, to see I, myself, in these accounts. So what's important is when we look at this, we see this anonymous woman approaches our Lord and, and is forgiven despite her, her many sins, that we, when we read St. Luke's Gospel, we can have the same confidence to approach Jesus and have all of our sins forgiven. And if our sins are greater than the sins of someone else, we can have confidence because Jesus has said, often those who have more sins are going to love more God than those who, who think that they don't have many sins and don't have much to ask for forgiveness for. So, um, so it makes sense that St. Luke will depersonalize this story, that he will make it a bit anonymous because he wants us to see ourselves in, in the gospel, to see ourselves as um, being able to approach Jesus as this woman did with confidence and to have our sins forgiven. In the same way that in St. John's Gospel, he never speaks about himself explicitly. He, he talks about the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Of course, this is um, certainly John himself of whom he is speaking. However, he's also inviting each one of us to see ourselves as the beloved disciple to place ourselves in his shoes and to experience the life of Jesus Christ the way he did. And uh, when we read the beloved disciple, we can think of ourselves, that Jesus has loved us, that he intends our salvation. And for example, when he says, um, woman, uh, behold your son, and be disciple, behold your mother, we can see in the, the uh, beloved disciple at the foot of the cross ourselves, who we should, uh, we need to accompany our Lord in his passion in order to be there for his resurrection. And also our Lord uh, gives to each one of us, and not only to John, the gift of his mother. So that's the other, let's say, interpretive key that we want to apply to this passage. And so it's not, it's never explicitly stated. There are other um, church fathers, the Eastern Father, St. John Chrysostom, who do uh, separate the various women in these accounts. But uh, for me, and for St. Gregory the Great, St. Bede, and for the Roman uh, tradition, it makes sense to identify them. Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene, I think, are certainly the same woman, because um, otherwise John's Gospel really makes no sense whatsoever. But I would invite you to uh, return to that on your own, to read the accounts. I've made a little chart, which I'll also bring up on the screen, which compares um, these three, three women or one woman. So you have the anonymous woman um, who anoints Jesus. You have 
the Mary who's identified as the sister of Martha. And in Luke's gospel, um, she is serving at table when there's, of course, the famous account of uh, Mary sitting at the feet of, of Jesus while Martha is serving and, and Martha complains. That's in Luke's gospel. And then um, we have in John's gospel, the resurrection of Lazarus and another anointing. Whether they're one anointing or two anointing, I hold for the, the theory that there are in fact two anointings of our Lord. So you're welcome to look into that on your own. And then as we noted last time that uh, all four evangelists identify Mary Magdalene at the, at the empty tomb. Uh, three of the evangelists place her at the foot of the cross. Uh, St. Luke doesn't mention her by name again. Um, so in any case, uh, Mary, uh, the sister of Martha, is, is not going to be identified explicitly as being at the foot of the cross. But if you put these three characters together and give them one psychological profile, if you will. You have a very consistent, very interesting, very rich character in the gospel who was a sinner but becomes a great disciple of our Lord who has an extreme sensitive love for Jesus, will follow him all the way to the foot of the cross and beyond. Uh, the same uh, woman who uh, sits at his feet, who is intent on hearing every word of, of Jesus and um, perhaps anoints him not once, but twice. Um, she, she received uh, mercy from our Lord the first time and maybe is going to desire to repeat this act, especially as she sees that things are, are going in a, in a bad direction and that um, Jesus is in danger and she wants to express his love for him a second time. I think if you put all these together, you have um, a fascinating and a very rich account of one Mary, Mary of Magdalene, who's also the sister of, um, of Martha and Lazarus. Whereas if you separate them, you have two or three characters where we know a little bit about each, but they, they don't add up to, to a lot. So you are, you are free, uh, as far as I am concerned, to hold either thesis, um, the, 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 the infallibility of the Roman Church, I don't think, is engaged by the question. However, we should note, again, there's the famous, uh, there's a famous phrase, legem credendi lex starwit supplicandi, which means that the, the law of how we, how we pray establishes the manner in which we believe. So the liturgy of the Church is a very important resource for understanding uh, the Gospels, for understanding even for understanding the magisterium of the church. And as you may have noted in the, the collect, which I read at the beginning of our session, the church uh, explicitly identified uh, Mary Magdalene as the sister of Lazarus. And in the, in the mass for St. Mary Magdalene on July the 22nd, up until the liturgical reforms of the 60s and 70s, it was in, indeed the gospel of the sinful woman who anoints our Lord in Luke chapter 7, which is the gospel of, of St. Mary Magdalene's feast. And so, yes, the church, uh, through a liturgy at the very least, has taught the identity of these women uh, for 1,400 years or more. So for me, the burden of, as a Catholic, the burden of proof is on someone to show that they are not the same woman, that it's not consistent, whereas to me, the evidence uh, suggests the contrary. So with that said, we will we'll, we'll bring things to a conclusion for today. I'll, I'll continue a little bit with uh, Mary Magdalene in our next episode. We'll also talk about the appearance of the risen Jesus to St. Peter. And we'll try to continue to examine the resurrection accounts and, and um, take from them all of the teachings that are available there. As I mentioned before, you're always welcome to contact me with any comments or questions or, or objections to anything I say. Uh, my email address is uh, canon.post 
www.ickspodcast.icksp at gmail.com. And I hope you've enjoyed our lesson so far, and we will, God willing, we will continue to provide lessons until the end of, of Paschal Tide. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Saint Mary Magdalene, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Regina, Regina, Regina.